episode five concerning Richard Ferguson. seen us by now, Paul. Yes. Oh, he's getting out of the car. You asked for this, my friend, and now you're going to get it. Look out, Steve. He's got a revolver. It's Mark Elliot. Temple. Why, I thought... Good heavens, I thought... Well, what did you think, Elliot? I thought you were someone else. I was sure that you were... Mrs. Temple, I'm terribly sorry frightening you like that. Is that revolver loaded? Yes. Who were you expecting? I'm sorry, Temple. I can't tell you. Was it Richard Ferguson? Yes. How did you know? You're not the only one who has an appointment with him. You mean you've come here to meet him? Yes, but whether you'll turn up is another matter. But, Temple, I can't believe you had an appointment with him tonight. You knew that sooner or later I should see young Ferguson and you deliberately followed me. That's not true. I had a phone call from him tonight at your restaurant. I promised to meet him here and give him this signet ring. That was about 20 minutes ago. Why does he want the ring? Your guess is as good as mine. It might even be better. Is that the truth? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was rude just now. I, quite frankly, this business has upset me. I've been terribly worried. What business? Well, I told you. Ferguson's blackmailing me. Why, only this morning he... Oh, look here, we, we can't talk standing about like this. Let's get into the car. Well, let's go back to our car. I've left my handbag there. Yes, all right, Steve. Come on, Elliot. Temple, what did Ferguson actually say to you when he spoke to you on the phone? That's an amazing story. You mean to say that Mrs. Gunnimer, Ferguson's landlady, was actually beaten up? I do. But why? Because someone was under the impression that she had the ring. Oh, that sounds incredible. It's like something out of a novel. I just can't believe it. Nevertheless, it's true. Now, tell me, did you intend to kill Ferguson? Oh, I don't know what I intended to do. I certainly didn't intend to give the young swine any more money. I thought perhaps if I threatened him, he'd come to his senses and... When did Ferguson first start to blackmail you? About six or seven weeks ago. You see, I... Well, I suppose I'd better tell you the truth. It all started at a party. One evening, I think it was about the last week in March, I went to a cocktail party given by Mavis Russell. She's quite a personality in Oxford, and she invited a lot of university people. When I arrived, a young man called Rudolf Charles was playing the piano. Rudolph, what is that thing you're playing? I'll give you a clue. It's Mendelssohn. Oh, of course, I remember. It's one of the songs without words. Clever girl. <laughs> Darling, must you keep sitting at the piano? Edward, see to the drinks. I'm sure everybody's dying of thirst. Yes, madam. Mavis, you're a bitter disappointment to me. I always thought you had an ear for music. I have, darling, and you play like an angel. But I want you to meet people. Hello, Mark. How nice to see you. My dear, I've been here for 20 minutes. I'm looking for a light sherry and a very pretty girl in a green dress. Well, we can certainly get you the sherry. Edward? It's all right, Mavis. I'll see to it. Thank you, darling. No, never, never. I don't see any sign of your protégé, Mavis. I suppose you mean Richard Fergus. I do. He hasn't arrived yet. And, Mark, he isn't my protégé. I've told you that before. I encourage him because, well, because I think he's got something. Oh, he has. He unquestionably has. He's got a confounded cheek. Why do you say that? Well, he phoned me this morning and said he wanted to see me. When I said I couldn't see him, not for a day or two at any rate... He got quite impertinent. Oh, here's Richard now. Mavis, my sweet, I'm terribly sorry. I'm late. We had an awful time getting here. One of... Oh, yes, I've, I've brought Dinah along. You don't mind, do you, darling? We're having dinner together, so it seems silly for us to... No, of course not. I'm delighted. Uh, what would you like to drink, Miss... Uh, Nelson. Oh, yes. Miss Nelson. May I have a gin and tonic? Yes, of course. Excuse me, madam. Yes, what is it? Mr. Elliot's wanted on the telephone, madam. I've switched it through to the study. Oh, thank you, Edward. Do you know where it is, Mark? No, I'm afraid I don't. It's all right, I'll show you. I shan't be a moment, Dinah. Yes, all right, Richard. This way, Mr. Elliot. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ferguson. Not at all. 
Where's the phone? It's over there in the corner. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, but I shouldn't bother with it if I were you. What do you mean? Well, I asked Edward to give you that message. You asked? Do you mean to say that I'm not wanted on the telephone? Sit down, Mr. Elliot. What do you mean, sit down? It's a perfectly simple statement. Sit down. I want to talk to you. Now, look here, young man. If you think these blockbusting tactics of yours are going to get you anywhere, you're very much mistaken. Mr. Elliot, you're being aggressive and unfriendly. I want to have a talk with you. A pleasant talk, I hope. This isn't a very good beginning. Oh, well, what is it you want? Fifteen hundred pounds. I beg your pardon? I said fifteen hundred pounds. You want me to lend you fifteen hundred pounds? I don't want you to lend me anything. I want you to give me fifteen hundred pounds. Give you? My dear boy, you're crazy. Now, come along. Don't let's waste any more time. Let's get back to the party. Uh, Mr. Elliot. Well? Uh, if this was in a book written by Mavis and published by your friend Mr. Keene, sooner or later I'd find myself saying, blackmail is a very ugly word, Mr. Elliot. Well... Just between ourselves, I don't think it's an ugly word at all. I think it's rather a delightful word. It gets straight to the point. Yes, in short, I'm blackmailing you. I want fifteen hundred pounds. And supposing I refuse? Do you remember a girl called Cynthia Stevens? Well, just in case you don't, let me refresh your memory. Fifteen years ago, uh, you were invited to a house party in Norfolk. A girl, a very young girl, called Cynthia Stevens, was also invited. And during the course of what I should imagine was not entirely an uneventful weekend, Miss Stevens committed suicide. At the inquest, you said that she was a comparative stranger and that you'd actually met her for the first time that weekend. Well, that wasn't true. You'd met her several times before. On one occasion, you'd even taken her over to Brussels for two or three days. Look, quite frankly, I don't know what you're talking about. I vaguely remember a girl called Cynthia Stevens, but it's a long time ago. I was very young then. You were and I... 31. Miss Stevens was 17. Sweet 17. I suppose you've got the letters. I've got three letters. I don't know whether you wrote any more or not. You want £1,500 for them? No, I didn't say that. Oh, what do you mean? I've got the letters. And I want £1,500. That doesn't mean to say I want £1,500 for the letters. Well, what the devil do you want? £1,500 to be going on with. Well, think it over, Mr. Elliot. Think it over. Now, shall we take your advice and join the party? My word, it does sound gay, doesn't it? Uh, I'll get you a light sherry. Uh, or would you prefer something stronger? I paid Ferguson the fifteen hundred pounds. Well, three weeks later, I paid him another hundred. How do you know that he has the letters? Has he shown them to you? He's got them all right. What happened today, Elliot? Did he phone you? Yes. Yes, I was in town. He phoned me about three o'clock. He said he was desperate, that he needed seven hundred pounds. He told me to meet him here tonight at nine o'clock. <laughs> Frankly, Temple... I'm not used to this sort of thing. I, I just don't know how to cope with it. Mm, you seem to be coping with it rather well. What do you mean? Judging by the revolver, you'd obviously made up your mind to take care of young Ferguson. I, I must have been crazy. I, I must have been out of my mind even to think of such a thing. But you know, Temple, I, I've got to get those letters back. What am I going to do? Well, I don't think you're going to get them back tonight. It's a uh, quarter past eleven already. Mr. Elliot, you say Richard phoned you this afternoon and arranged to meet you here. Yes. How do you account for the fact that he asked us to meet him here at the same time? Mm. I can't account for it, Mrs. Temple. We know why he phoned us. He wants the ring. It's simply a question of why he picked this particular place at this particular time. I, I can't imagine why. Well, he's obviously not going to keep the appointment. I think it's about time we made a move, Steve. Yes. Temple, hmm? would you mind driving me back into Oxford? I really don't feel like driving. Yes, yeah, certainly. But what about your car? Oh, I'll get my chauffeur to pick it up tomorrow morning. It'll be all right not actually parked on the road. All right, Elliot. Thank you, Temple. Thank you very much. Slow down, Paul. I think we're coming to the crossroads. No, it's about another quarter of a mile, Mrs. Temple. Oh, is it? Elliot, the night we first met at the encounter, you told me that Richard was blackmailing you, and you inferred that Mrs. Russell knew all about it. I did? Yes. You said you had a motive for murdering young Ferguson. When I asked you what the motive was, you said 
Do you mean to tell me that Mavis Russell hasn't told you? I'm sorry I said that, because I don't really think it was true. You mean you don't think Mrs. Russell did know that you were being blackmailed? Uh, it's difficult to say. Mavis knows a great deal of what goes on in Oxford, at least what goes on in our particular circle. She may know that I'm being blackmailed. Probably thinks young Ferguson simply putting the pressure on me. Ferguson's a careerist, you know. He, he likes to think that he... Hello. What's happened here? Slow down, Paul. There's been an accident by the look of things. Why, Timothy, look. That car's on fire. The police are here, Temple. I wonder what's happened. What's happened, officer? My name's Paul Temple. Good evening, Mr. Temple. We don't know, sir. Rather looks as if the petrol tank exploded, sir. Is there anyone in the car? Yes, I'm afraid there is, sir. We've been trying to get him out, but we can't get near enough. Wait a minute. What is it, Paul? I want to have a look at that car. Just look at those fellows. I don't know how the devil they do it. Stand back over there! Please, stand back over there! The heat must be terrific. Yes, yeah, awful. Keep it steady! Petrol tank. Where's Paul? Here he is. Get out of the car, Elliot. I want you a moment. Darling, what is it? It's young Ferguson's car. What? I tell you, it's Ferguson's car. I checked the number. It's the one he gave me on the phone. What do you want me to do? There's a man in the car, Elliot. When they get him out, I want you to take a look at him. All right, boys. Take him steady. They're getting him out. Yes. Stand back there, please, Stemmett. You must stand here in the car. Excuse me, isn't it Mr. Temple? Why, hello, Mackintosh. What are you doing here? Well, I'm supposed to be on my way back to London, but this held me up. It's a nasty business. Yes, it is indeed. It's a very nasty business. I don't see how it happened. The petrol tank couldn't have been the cause of it because we heard it blow up a few moments ago. Now what's happening? They've got him out of the car. I poor devil. Come on, Elliot. You'd better come too, Macintosh. Oh, what do you mean? I want you both to take a look at this man. I've got a hunch you'll recognize him. Recognize him? What on earth does he mean, Mr. Elliot? Uh, excuse me, please. Ex excuse me. I'm sorry, sir. You can't come through here. That's all right, George. I'm afraid we were too late, Mr. Temple. He's dead. I want these two gentlemen to take a look at him. Yes, all right. Well, I don't care about five minutes. Now, please, stand back. There you are, sir. Oh, my God. Oh. You were right, Tim. Do you recognize him, Macintosh? Yes, of course. It's Richard Ferguson. Good night, Mr. Temple. If you want to get in touch with me, I'll be at the same hotel, the Cromwell. I thought you were going back to London. I was, but I've changed my mind. I don't want Dinah to hear about this from anyone else. She was very fond of Richard. This is going to be a terrible blow. Excuse me, sir. Yes? You're quite certain that it is Richard Ferguson? Quite certain. There's no mistake this time. There's no doubt about it, officer. Thank you, sir. May I have a word with you, Mr. Temple? Yes, of course. I'll see you at the car, Elliot. Yes, all right. Good night. Good night, Macintosh. Mr. Temple... Ferguson was dead before the car caught fire, sir. What do you mean? I've just taken another look at the body, sir. He was shot. My dear Sir Graham, I came to this ghastly little police station because I was under the impression that I might be able to help. Well, you certainly can be of some help, Mrs. Russell, by answering my questions. But you keep asking me the same question over and over again. I told you, I haven't the slightest idea why Richard Ferguson wanted the signet ring. I see. Mrs. Russell, do you mind if I ask you a question? No. Did you know that Mr. Elliot was being blackmailed by Richard Ferguson? Mark being blackmailed... <laughs> Don't be absurd. What do you mean? Have you met Mark Elliot? You know I have. Well, does he strike you as being the sort of man who would let himself be blackmailed by a student? 
Mark's a cool, calculating businessman. He wouldn't be blackmailed by anybody. But he might do a spot of it himself. Supposing it was Elliot who told me that he was being blackmailed. That he also told me that you knew that he was being blackmailed. Then I should say that he was not only a cool, calculating businessman, but a cool, calculating liar. Look, it's a quarter past four, Sir Graham. I have an appointment with my hairdresser at half past. I should rather like to keep it. Yes, all right, Mrs. Russell. I suppose we know where to get in touch with you. You do indeed. Goodbye, Mr. Temple. I'm sorry you've been so badly misinformed. I'll try and make up for it. I don't like that woman. If she's an intellectual, thank heavens I didn't marry one. <laughs> the main thing is not to underrate her. Temple, do you think she's mixed up in this business? I mean, really mixed up in it. Yes, I do. You don't think that she's Jonathan? Well, she could be, Sir Graham. On the other hand... Yes, what is it, Sergeant? Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson here, sir. They're in the inspector's office. All right, Sergeant. We'll come down. Very good, sir. Come along, Temple. I, I don't believe it. I don't believe that Richard was mixed up in anything that was dishonest. I, I knew my own son. He may have been impetuous. Helen, but... please. I know this is very painful for you, Mrs. Ferguson. But I'm afraid you've got to face the facts, and the facts are not very pleasant. I suppose you've read the report in the newspapers about the car accident? Yes. Well, it wasn't an accident. We rather <coughs> gathered that from what the inspector said. Your son was shot. Shot? Oh, no. I'm afraid it's true. According to our medical report, he was shot before the car was set on fire. Whether the person who shot him started the fire, we don't know. Of course the fire was started by the same person. He wanted the whole thing to look like an accident. Now, you can Sir Graham, I don't want to be offensive, but I don't think you people have been too bright over this business. Really? Well, when you discovered that Richard wasn't murdered, I mean in the first place, you ought to have picked him up. You ought to have had every cop in town on the lookout for him. But we did. We tried to pick him up. Don't forget the police thought Richard was dead. You thought so too, Ferguson. You refused to believe that he was alive, even when your wife saw him. Yeah, I know that, but... Oh, look, Temple, let's have our cards on the table. What's this business all about? Why was our boy murdered? Well, in my opinion, he was murdered because someone was under the impression that he had the signet ring. The, the signet ring? Yes. You mean his own ring? Yes. Well, why shouldn't he have it? I don't get this. I think you guys are barking up the wrong tree. I think there's a girl mixed up in this somewhere. Yes, I think so too, Mr. Temple. A little while ago, Richard wrote us a letter about a girl called Dinah Nelson. He appeared to be very friendly with her. Yes, I think he was. Haven't you met Miss Nelson? No, we haven't. And then there's this other woman, this Mrs. Russell. Do you think she knows anything about this? Yes, it's possible. Well, why don't you get her down here? Why don't you question her? We have questioned her. She left here only a few minutes ago. Oh, sorry. Oh, Mr. Ferguson, I want you to take a look at this. What is it? Now, take a look at it. It's a photostatic copy of a message that was on the first Jonathan card. What, what is it, Robert? Well, it's just a list of letters and numbers, so far as I can see. Is this supposed to mean something? Let Mrs. Ferguson have a look at it. Thank you. Well, does that make sense to you? Not to me, it doesn't. Nor to me. I see. Now, Mrs. Ferguson, tell me, hmm? when was the last time you saw your son? Why, that night. The night I saw him standing outside of the hotel. You've never seen him since? No. You know that he telephoned your husband one night and asked him to meet him at a house in Lewisham? Yes. Robert told me. Were you surprised? Yes, of course I was. Hey, what is this? Mr. Ferguson had a heart attack and was unable to keep the appointment. Mr. Temple kept it. But instead of seeing your son, he found the dead body of a man called Red Harris. Yes, I know. Had you ever heard of Red Harris? No, never. So, in spite of the fact that he telephoned your husband, Richard made no attempt to get in touch with you, Mrs. Ferguson. No, he didn't. I see. Well, thank you both. We'll be in touch with you. If anything important develops, we'll most certainly let you know. Uh, we thought of going back to London tonight. Is that okay? Yes, yes, yes. I, I take it you're still at the same hotel. Oh, yes, for the time being, at any rate. Oh, goodbye, Temple. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Ferguson. Goodbye. I'll be back in a moment, Temple. Right. Oh, 
Oh, hello, Mrs. Ferguson. I, uh, I think I left my handbag. Your handbag? Oh, yes. yes, here it is. Oh, thank you. Mr. Temple. Yes? Get in touch with Dinah Nelson. Tell her I sent you. Did you tell Sir Graham what Mrs. Ferguson said? No, I didn't. It doesn't make sense, does it? First of all, she said she didn't know Dinah Nelson, and then later she said, get in touch with her and tell her she sent you. Yes. But why on earth do you think she said that? I don't know. Oh, hello. This looks like the place. Weldon Court. Hmm. Looks impressive. Hmm, it does, doesn't it? Good evening, sir. Can oh, I help you? Yes, good evening. Uh, Miss Nelson, is that number three? Uh, yes, sir. Flat three, first floor. Oh, thank you. Do you happen to know if Miss Nelson's in? Oh, yes, she is, sir. She came in about quarter past seven. Oh. Well, I shall take the lift, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Ah, this is three. It certainly has an expensive look. Mm, the rents must be pretty steep. Yes. As you said, she couldn't live here just on her salary. No. I should ring again, Paul. She can't be in. Mm, doesn't look like it. Well, the porter must have been mistaken. She's probably got... What is it? Do you smell anything? Oh, it's gas. Yes. What are you doing? Uh, the key's in the lock. Oh, you don't think she's tried to commit suicide? I do. Here, hold this newspaper, Steve. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Now, now, spread it out on the floor. Uh, what are you going to do? I'm going to put it under the door and try to get the key to fall on it. I I'll do it. Yes, that's it. Now, steady, steady. Keep, keep it flat. It's under. Right. Now. Ah. You've done it. Yes. Now, pull the paper out from under the door. Mm -hmm. Gently, gently, Steve. Now, not, not too fast. Mm -hmm. They're careful. I've got it. Ah. Good. <coughs> oh. <coughs> oh. <coughs> <coughs> Stay where you are, Steve. <coughs> she, she's over there, and, uh, Oh, near, near the gas fire. Yes, I'll, I'll open, <coughs> open the window. <coughs> I've turned off the gas. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Help me to get her over yeah. to the window. <coughs> she, all right. I don't know. Miss Nelson. Oh. Here, Miss Nelson. Careful, you, you'll hurt her. I, I've got to get her. Near <coughs> the window. It's beginning to clear. Yeah. <coughs> Miss Nelson. Oh. Yeah. Miss Miss Nelson. She's coming round. <coughs> yes. Yes, I think she's. <coughs> Where am I? I well. <coughs> now, now it's all right. It's all right. Now, just just take it easy. Take it easy. Just take a, a, a deep breath. I, I must have fainted. I must... Oh, I, I remember. I remember now. I tried to... Oh, everything's going round, Mr. Temple. I can't see properly. I feel dizzy. Is she going to be all right, Paul? Yes. <coughs> yeah, she'll be all right. Go into the bedroom, Steve. <coughs> See if she left a note for anyone. <coughs> yes, all right. <coughs> now, come along. Relax, Miss Nelson. 
Come on, just close your eyes. There. That's it. Oh. I feel better now. Now, oh, good. Now, just sit quiet for a moment or so. Mr. Temple, I tried to commit suicide. Mm. I made up my mind that I, I couldn't stand things any longer. That, that I, I... Paul? Yes? Here a moment. What is it, Steve? You were right. There is a note. It was on the dressing table in the bedroom. Well? It's for Jonathan. That was the fifth episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery by Francis Durbridge. The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. The play was produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster.